Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about methamphetamine officially and methylamphetamine. It's a highly addictive recreational stimulant. It also has euphoric activities, aphrodisiac activities. About 35 million people use it in the world, which makes it one of the most commonly misused stimulants. Some areas of the United States it's actually more frequently abused than the opioids can be prescribed for ADHD and obesity, chemically similar to the amphetamines that are also used for ADHD, and for narcolepsy. Common names for methamphetamine would be speed, or crystal meth, or tina, or blue ice, or just ice. The level of use in the United States is pretty startling. If we look at people between 18 and 35, well, lifetime, about 2.5% of the population, look at people over age 36 overall, somewhere between five and a half and six and a half percent of the people have used the drug at least once and during the past year, among 18 to 35 year olds, the rate of use is about three quarters of one percent and if we look in the past week alone, somewhere around three quarters of a million people have used methamphetamine. It causes at least a hundred thousand emergency room visits. Half of those visits are associated with other drugs as well. As far as deaths are concerned, in 35 reporting states, well, there are more deaths in 14 of those states than there are with fentanyl, while the death rate from the opioid seems to be going down. The death rate from methamphetamine use has been increasing dramatically. Actually, it's increased by twofold since 2015. Significant social and medical and psychiatric effects because of methamphetamine. Now, actually, methamphetamine is two different chemicals. There's the L form and the D form. The D form, that has stronger stimulant activity in the central nervous system. It causes a rush of dopamine. There's no natural equivalent. The first use of the methamphetamine is associated with a rush of pleasure, and you continue to use the drug in an attempt to replicate that initial feeling. Now, it's available as a legal drug, as a prescription drug, as a Schedule II controlled substance, but it's not refillable. It's used for ADHD and short term for weight loss. Not routinely prescribed. The medicine's called desoxin, lower dose than the dose that the recreational users find that it's appropriate for them. Now, methamphetamine is easier to obtain than cocaine, both. Cocaine and methamphetamine are going to increase the amount of dopamine, but methamphetamine lasts longer in the system. Methamphetamine also can be manufactured relatively easily at home through recipes available on the internet. Preferred method of use of methamphetamine, well, it varies depending on where we're talking about as far as the time and the geography is concerned, so it can be smoked or injected. Levels quickly reach the brain, immediate rush amplifies the addiction potential. The effect starts very rapidly, but unfortunately it fades quickly. That leads to repeated doses, the binging and the crashing and the runs. Uh, people give up food and they give up sleep. They continue to use the drug for several days. They use it every several hours to get the pleasurable effect, but actually the pleasurable effects decrease faster than the concentration of the bloodstream decreases. So you have a rush that lasts several minutes, said to be extremely pleasurable. But then some people snort the drug or take it by mouth, associated with euphoria, but it's not quite as intense. You don't get that intense rush. So snorting, the effects are three to five minutes. Orally, it's 15 to 20 minutes. And the abuse of the drug, of methamphetamine, is not equal throughout the United States. It's more in the West and the Midwest than it is in the East. It's actually a uh, significantly greater problem than the opioids in the West. If we look at the likelihood of use, well, some people are afraid of dying of fentanyl, so they turn to meth. Other people turn to meth to help them withdraw from the opioids, or sometimes use of the opioids causes such a, an amount of depression that people turn to the methamphetamine as a stimulant after using the opioids. Now it's often used in combination with heroin or fentanyl, speedball, that's heroin and a stimulant, oftentimes methamphetamine. 
some users find that the reaction with the two, the heroin and the stimulant, methamphetamine, actually gives them a greater effect than either one alone. Heightens the perception of the high and avoids the sluggishness and the sleepiness of the heroin. Makes people feel more mellow. Well, the base of methamphetamine actually is a yellowish brownish colored material, but crystal meth, which is highly purified, well, that tends to be somewhat clearer bluish. Amateur chemists can easily make it, but since about 2010, the number of illicit laboratories has decreased quite markedly in the United States. What does the methamphetamine do? Well, it's not a direct sympathomimetic. It doesn't actually stimulate anything, but what it does is it leads to an increase in the amount of monoamines at the synapse between the two nerve cells leads to an increased concentration of dopamine and serotonin and noradrenaline and norepinephrine and that leads to an increased release and a decreased uptake of the substances and the chemical that moves them about the transporter chemical is decreased so when you use either the cocaine or the amphetamine increased wakefulness increased physical activity increases a person's mood and alertness increases the activity and the talkativeness, increases the concentration and the energy. If you happen to be fatigued, it's a stimulant. So it decreases the appetite, leads to weight loss, faster breathing, irregular heart rate, faster heart rate, leads to an increase in the blood pressure, increase in body temperature, feeling of euphoria, increase in the sexual drive. Actually, some people continue their sexual activities for several days, but unfortunately, it leads to abnormal judgment, altered judgment, altered decision-making, leads to unprotected sex, leads to problems with thinking and understanding and learning and memory. If it's injected, then there's another problem on top of everything else because there's the shared needle, shared paraphernalia. It seems that people who use methamphetamine and acquire HIV, the HIV seems to more rapidly divide. Well, it also can lead to hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and then because unsterile conditions are used, leads to skin infections or abscesses, and people who use methamphetamine have a significant increase in the psychiatric problems. So with prolonged use, with higher doses, estimated that somewhere between 15 and 25% of users have significant psychiatric problems. And if we look at the people who go and seek care in a medical facility, about 60% have psychiatric abnormalities. Now, sometimes they can either be transient or they can be persistent. And it's estimated that about 5 to 10 or 15% of the meth users are going to develop a psychosis, hallucinations, and other kind of similar problems. And they're going to fail to completely recover even if they use the antipsychotic drugs and on discontinuation, the symptoms still can last for hours to months with the hallucinations and the persecutory delusions. Sometimes there's persistent irritability and anxiety and depression. Changes the structure and function of the brain. Has long-lasting social and occupational effects with deterioration, of course. And when used in combination with other drugs, leads to more violent behavior and paranoia and seizures and sometimes bleeding into the brain. Sometimes there's breakdown of skeletal muscle, changes actually the structure and the function of the brain, and leads to itching, the feeling that bugs are on the surface of your skin, called crank bugs, leads to panic and erratic behavior and difficulty feeling any kind of pleasure. Seems that even after people successfully discontinue the use of the medicine, that stress can spontaneously precipitate recurrence of the psychoses, especially in people who've previously had psychotic reactions. And because of those chemical and structural changes in the brain, leads to decreased coordination, reduced verbal learning. Some of the changes reversible after about a year or so, but it does increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. And we all hear about talk of oral manifestations of methamphetamine abuse. Well, there's the meth mouth that leads to tooth loss and poor nutrition and lack of dental hygiene. And sometimes people have a tendency to grind their teeth or clench their jaws, bruxism we call it. Leads to cracked teeth, 
seems to be worse with the injected form, but it still is with the oral or the smoked or the inhaled form. Leads to dry mouth. That seems to be associated with an increased use of carbonated beverages or beverages with sweeteners in them. And that unfortunately leads to further problems with the teeth. And another problem that was just relatively recently discovered associated with methamphetamine is pulmonary artery hypertension. It's high blood pressure inside the lungs rather than inside the veins and the arteries. Well, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary artery hypertension, was first described in 1891, but it was rare until the 1960s. And then subsequently it became progressively more common, where today it's a relatively common condition. It's estimated that about a third of the people who have pulmonary artery hypertension have used some of the stimulants. The problem caught national attention with the fenfluramine. Remember the fen fen diet of some years ago? And that seemed to be a major cause of pulmonary artery hypertension. Then the first link to methamphetamine goes back to about the late 1990s with truck drivers. They were using the methamphetamine to keep them awake unfortunately led to an increase in the arterial pressure inside the pulmonary circuit and that led to heart failure. And talk about heart failure, if you use methamphetamine there's a greater risk that you're going to suffer from hypertension and cardiac muscle damage, coronary artery disease and myocardial infarctions and stroke and sudden cardiac death. It's actually the most the second most frequent cause of aortic dissections leads to heart failure and dilated chambers. Well, it can lead to tremors. An interesting study looked at one year worth of orthopedic trauma at USC, that's level one trauma center, and found that 10% of all of the orthopedic injuries were related to methamphetamine. Could be anything from a hand laceration to an infection to a motor vehicle accident to being shot or a knife wound. People who are using methamphetamine more likely to be engaged in robberies and assaults and burglary and shoplifting and other kind of violent crimes. Pregnancy, uh, it's a bad combination, terrible combination. Leads to increased prematurity, leads to placental disruption. Babies are small sized, they come out lethargic oftentimes, they have heart and brain abnormalities. Sometimes there's the neonatal withdrawal syndrome. Children have abnormal increased sleep, poor feeding, they have tremors. Sometimes they require medical care, but the problem is that in the children of mothers who use methamphetamine, we find that those children, one to two years later, they still have decreased arousal, poor quality of movement, and at four or five years old, their behavior looks more like a two or a three year old. Seems that the brain doesn't develop chronologically at the same rate that we would expect in an otherwise normal child, and even in school age children, if those children were exposed to the methamphetamine in utero, and they still have mild, subtle behavioral and learning issues. And there are long-term effects, of course. Long-term damage to the heart and the brain and the liver and the lung and the kidney. Leads to the hypertension that can be associated with stroke or heart attack. Soft tissue damage to the nose if you snort the substance. If you smoke the substance, gets into the lungs, cause damage to the lungs. Seems that there's an increased incidence of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease among people who have used methamphetamine. Methamphetamine culture, well, they involve risky sexual activities, especially men having sex with men, and even in heterosexual population. It causes an increase in the libido with a rush of methamphetamine. But long-term users have decreased sexual function. So you have an aphrodisiac, but unfortunately you have decreased sexual function, inhibition of the ejaculation, increased sexually transmitted diseases, more genital sores and abrasions that facilitate the entry of the pathogens. Some people leads to priapism. There's tweaking where people have paranoid, irritable behavior. They lack sleep for several days. They're more often using methamphetamine to get that difficult to obtain high. They get frustrated and irritable. They have unsteady behavior. 
unpredictable. They're violent. Oftentimes they involved in domestic arguments and damage to themselves and to other people. These people have abnormal movement of the eyes, jerking movements. They have an increased incidence of covering their activities by using alcohol or some of the opioids to cover some of their methamphetamine-related behaviors. But these further complicate the whole situation and their negative feelings and paranoia and frustration that come out. And then ultimately there's the severe crash where they sleep excessively. Now, if you have certain kind of medical conditions and you use methamphetamine, you're asking for disaster. So if you take an MAO inhibitor and you use methamphetamine, you're probably going to have major cardiovascular problems or die if you have a history of heart attack or stroke or a transient ischemic attack, severe hypertension or hardening of the arteries or heart failure or Raynaud's disease or severe agitation or psychosis, you have bipolar disorder, mania, if you tend to be suicidal or have severe anxiety, hyperthyroidism, you have an increased intraocular pressure, glaucoma, certain kind of kidney disease, asking for trouble, or well, methamphetamine, it's a molecule that's similar to both amphetamine and dopamine. It's different from cocaine. Cocaine has a half-life of about an hour. It's plant-derived. Methamphetamine has a half-life overall, the two forms, of about 12 hours. It's man-made. It increases the amount of dopamine more so than cocaine. It blocks the reuptake of the dopamine into the cell, and it increases the release of the dopamine. Cocaine just blocks the reuptake of the dopamine. Now, unfortunately, dopamine tends to cause deterioration of the dopaminergic neurons that are in the midbrain, damages the serotonin neurons in the central nervous system, causes some gray matter loss in volume. We know that the D form that's the stronger psychostimulant, it has about a tenfold greater activity on the striatal dopamine containing nerves than the L-methamphetamine. L-methamphetamine stronger peripherally, has a much longer half-life. That's why the addicts seem to think it lasts longer, but it has a much shorter psychodynamic effect overall the half-life varies anywhere between as low as five hours and as long as 30 hours. It seems that methamphetamine stimulates the particular gene or chemical from the gene called delta Fos B, and that's associated with addiction, all sorts of addiction, whether we're talking about alcohol or methylphenidate or cocaine or the cannabinoids or nicotine or the opioids. It gives you a natural reward that comes from food or sex or exercise. It seems that that's one of the areas where dopamine centrally works. Now, if we look at the addicts, about 60% of the people who come off of the drug are going to relapse within a year. About 50% of the addicts use it for more than 10 years. The other use it for about one to four years. If we look at the metabolism of methamphetamine in the body, it's slowed down. If you happen to be taking an inhibitor of the enzyme that degrades the methamphetamine, that's called 2D6. So if you're taking Wellbutrin or Paxil or Prozac or you're taking quinidine or you're taking the chloroquine, that's going to boost the amount of methamphetamine in the system. Methamphetamine is going to counteract the effects of antipsychotic drugs, antihypertensive drugs going to decrease the effect of sedatives if you're taking them. It's going to be additive to other stimulants. And as I mentioned before, if you happen to be taking an MAO inhibitor for depression and you take the methamphetamine, that's pretty much it. Well, you can overdose on methamphetamine. If you overdose on methamphetamine, you have to realize it may well be very severe. And as a matter of fact, about 15% of all overdose deaths in the United States right now are due to methamphetamine, about 50% in addition, they're using an opioid, and 50% of the time that opioid happens to be fentanyl. Symptoms of overdose, well, a stroke, a heart attack, circulatory collapse, body temperature goes up very high, pulmonary hypertension that we talked about, the muscles break down, there's a serotonin syndrome, psychotic behavior, hallucinations, 
decreased urinary output, bleeding into the brain, coma, death. Those are symptoms that are associated with too much methamphetamine, overdose on methamphetamine, and withdrawal lasts to depression, and the depression lasts longer than it would if you were taking cocaine, oftentimes anxiety and fatigue, intense craving. Withdrawal comes about 24 hours after you discontinue the methamphetamine, up to 90% of the chronic high-dose users are going to develop some withdrawal symptoms. It's going to last about three to four weeks, and after they're all gone, then you have a post-acute withdrawal syndrome that can last for many months if you happen to have been a heavy user. Crash is going to occur within the first week drug craving and dysphoria, and you're going to have decreased movement, lack of motivation, sleepiness or sleeplessness, you're going to have vivid and lucid dreams. And unfortunately, we don't really have any kind of treatment. If you're on the opioids, we have some kind of medicines, but not if you're on methamphetamine. And there are a lot of clinics that are springing up. The value of those treatment centers, unfortunately, we just don't really know. In the future, it seems that there might be a vaccine, a vaccine to keep the methamphetamine from getting into the brain, or a monoclonal antibody that will actually bind to the methamphetamine and to neutralize the methamphetamine. And it's possible that we can develop some dopamine-type drugs that mimic the effect that don't have some of the toxicity. And talk about toxicity. If you make the methamphetamine for just a pound of methamphetamine, you're going to use about five to seven pounds of waste, manufacture five to seven pounds of waste, that are going to be highly toxic to the environment. Methamphetamine was first synthesized in 1887, synthesized in Germany by a Romanian chemist, and sort of lingered around for a while. But by the 1930s, it was used in increasing quantity throughout the world as a bronchodilator, as an inhalant, a nasal decongestant. Later on, it was used for obesity during World War II. There was Pervitin. Pervitin was made by a Berlin-based pharmaceutical company that was distributed by the German government to the German soldiers, known as the Stuka tablets, or the Hermann Goring pills. But unfortunately, they learned very quickly that that wasn't a good idea. So they started cutting back in 1940. That's because the soldiers were unable to perform their activities. They were basically not useful as soldiers. For one to two days after they used it, they had drug hangovers. They looked more like zombies. Actually, some of them turned violent, not only to civilians, but also to officers and then, uh, German forces. Well, then in the 1950s and 1960s, here in the country, we had Obitrol. Obitrol is a type of methamphetamine that was used for diet, so for weight loss. Well, unfortunately, that caused a significant number of problems, so the government regulated it. Now, it's sold by the Danish pharmaceutical company Lundbeck as desoxin, also sold as a generic by Mylan and Riccardati, a number of different chemical companies, but it's not really highly prescribed, about 16,000 prescriptions each year. It's used for ADHD and obesity and off-label for narcolepsy and hypersomnia, excessive sleepiness. Well, at the present time, it seems that we now have methamphetamine that's four to six times stronger than it was 10, 15 years ago. And actually, it's the favorite hard drug rather than cocaine. It's been that way since about the year 2000. And unlike heroin, that's cut with a variety of substances and you're not sure of the purity, with crystal meth, it's more than 80% pure. Now, remember we said there were two forms, the D form and the L form? Well, the L form is still available. It's still over the counter. It's actually called Lev methamphetamine. And Lev methamphetamine, that's the international name, the official international name. That's what Vicks nasal inhaler is, or CVS brand nasal decongestant vapor inhaler. That's what it is. So that's the story of methamphetamine. Once widely used medically, but now it's hardly used legally anymore. It was in fashion in the 50s and 60s for weight loss, but now 
Unfortunately, it's one of the stimulants that leads to so much addiction, and unfortunately, the drug has so many side effects and complications in using it. People think they're strong, that they're going to be able to kick the habit. It's very difficult to kick the habit, so you should really think quite strongly before you consider taking the drug, no matter how likely you are to not be affected by the drug, you use it, you're going to get hooked. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing. That way you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.